Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books Network. I'm your host, Schneer Zalman Newfield. America's community colleges are facing a completion crisis. The college going experience of too many students is interrupted, lengthening their time to completing a degree, or worse, causing many to drop out altogether. In The Costs of Completion, published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2021, Robin Isserles contextualizes this crisis by placing blame on the neoliberal policies that have shaped public community colleges over the past 30 years. The Costs of Completion offers a deeper, more complex understanding of who community college students are, why and how they enroll, and what higher education institutions can do to better support them and help them flourish. Robin Isserles is a professor of sociology at the Borough of Manhattan Community College of the City University of New York. She's a dear friend and colleague, and I'm so glad her new book has brought her to our program. Welcome, Robin. Hi, thanks, Alman. Thanks so much for having me. So to get started, could you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to write this work? So uh, a few things. Um, I'm what I, I've called myself a third generation CUNY student. Um, uh, my grandmother CUNY is the City University of New University York. Of New York, correct. Um, my grandmother, uh, single parent, uh, went back to school at what was call- then called City College Downtown, which later became Baruch College, uh, and put herself uh, through college one one class at a time. Uh, more in the summer when she shipped my mother and my uncle to summer camp uh, and became a teacher in the New York City public schools. Um, Both my parents uh, attended Queens College and I went to the Graduate Center uh, to pursue my PhD. So I tell my students that CUNY is in my blood. Uh, I feel very committed uh, to this incredibly important uh, public institution uh, and what it uh, does for so many, uh, what it has done and what it continues to do for so many people uh, in New York City. Um, the other uh, motivating uh, part, so I've been teaching at BMCC, Borough of Manhattan Community College, for uh, over 20 years now. And I've so I've been... Um, a witness to so many of the uh, changes and the proposed solutions of how we can, uh, you know, serve students better. Um, uh, from 2011 to 2013, I actually left BMCC for two years to uh, direct a, a, a research project looking at academic momentum of community college students in CUNY. And academic momentum, which I get into in the book, is this theory uh, that uh, the more students are integrated into their education, uh, especially in the first year, the more classes they take, uh, the more, you know, academically and socially integrated they are, the more likely that they will persist and graduate on time. So I was invited to uh, be part of this, uh, you know, multi-year project um, looking at whether this is um, a theory that works on community college students, because when it was first uh, researched, community colleges were not part of the analysis. Um, and so a lot of what I've been thinking about was shaped and informed by working on that research project and then having that be a place or, and a time for me to think more introspectively of what I was doing in the classroom. And it led me to this book uh, because a lot of the direction that we've been taking to address this so-called completion crisis, um, I think does not work for the majority of our students, especially those who are much more academically or, and or economically precarious. Right, right. So thank you for that. Um, to to help uh, listeners who are not familiar with this, um, what are community colleges? Uh, and um, well, let's start with that. <laughs> so community colleges started in the early 1900s. They were called junior colleges. Uh, and, and, you know, the thing about community colleges is, is they've always had multiple purposes. Um, they were always about workforce development. They were always about uh, pre-college programs uh, to develop uh, educators, for example. Um, and But they were called junior colleges. Um, the, the name community college came became more in fashion in the 19th later on uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, and uh, they, uh, 
as we began to include more and more people into higher ed, community colleges became more of a home for some, you know many of the students who perhaps never thought of themselves as college students. And that's uh, you know the more recent. Uh, incarnation of the community colleges. So community colleges, um, they exist in urban areas and cities. They exist in rural areas. Um, they're places for, for people who leave the workforce who want to uh, reskill or retool. Um, they are for uh, high school graduates or uh, students who get GED equivalent, you know, co- high school equivalencies um, to as a first step in their college journey. Um, more and more, they are places Places for students to spend the first two years of their education in a way to save some money, given the very high cost of college in, in the United States. Um, they are for older students, uh, student, uh, you know, students who have been in the workforce for a long time, maybe retire and want to take a few classes that they've never pursued before, or uh, for uh, women who didn't pursue an education and had families to return to to uh, follow their degree. Um, their degree path. So it's really a, a it, it's a kind of an amazing uh, el- experience. And, and certainly it, it, we see this in the classrooms, right? When we have such a diversity of, of students in terms of why they're sitting in our classrooms. Absolutely. Um, just to give us a little more of a sense of the, the, the community college landscape, approximately how many community colleges are there uh, throughout the United States? And I mean, a rough estimate. And do we have uh, a sense of, again, a, just a rough estimate of approximately how many students are enrolled in community colleges throughout the United States. Just so we, we have a sense of w- what, you know, the proportions of the, the, the universe that we're, we're, we're talking about. So there's about, I would say, I think there's around uh, close to 1,500 community colleges. Most of them are public, um, but not all of them. Um, and I'm trying to, I actually, I'm very bad at, um, recalling statistics. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. Okay. Me Um, too. Definitely. uh, So, um, I mean, just a ballpark figure. We're talking about a a million students. We're talking about, you know, some sense of, of the proportions. If, 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 if you, 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 you could uh, think of that, if not, that's not really, um, you know, it's not urgent. (laughs) So there's, well, I, at CUNY, I know, oh, so, uh, yeah, so um, this is from about 2019. There's about seven, almost eight million students enrolled in two-year schools. Wow. Um, although the two-year school designation is also going under some uh, level of transformation because there's so many um, uh, schools now with dual programs. Um, so they have, they offer both uh, an associate's degree, which is the normal community college degree, but also bachelor level degrees. Mm. And so they are no longer counted as community colleges. So it's, uh, so, you know, there's, there's some fuzziness around the numbers. Um, sure, sure. So, but about 8 million students. Um, and um, in the fall of 2020, there were about almost 5 million enrolled, which makes up about 30% of our undergraduate students. Um and I will say that more are part-time, about 3 million are part-time, uh, one, about a million and a half are full-time. Um, and CUNY is actually the opposite. CUNY has more full-time than part-time. So CUNY deviates sometimes from some of the national trends. Right. I see. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I'm curious, um, uh, you, you start at the outset of your book, you talk about um, how your own undergraduate um, experience uh, uh, and the role or the place of college in your life was uh, significantly different from the approach uh, to college of many of the students at community colleges. Could you talk a little bit about that? What are those differences? Sure. I mean, I, I think that one of the salient features that um, – we need more attention to in this conversation is about social class and its role and how we think about college education, um, how we are, um, uh, you know, in, in our sort of in our families. I think there's not as much of a difference anymore by class of the importance of a college education. I think you find that crosses class boundaries, but about the enculturation around college, uh, especially, you know, at the community college, many of our students are first generation 
I call them first generation ish students because a lot of them have had parents who have gone to college. But there's a different kind of family socialization around college going than I think happens in many middle class or more what we call traditional college students' uh, lives. Um, and also, I was writing this uh, that uh, uh, during the time that my my own daughter was also going through the college uh, process, and I was noting the, some of the differences. You know, when you are thinking about applying to a college as a residential student, one who lives on campus, uh, oftentimes far away from home. Uh, um, it's, it's a very different experience. You go, you know, you start to research the schools, uh, that you're interested in. You're thinking, you're placing yourself there, uh, emotionally, cognitively, if you will. Um, you are, um, talking to lots of people about their college experiences. Uh, you are visiting the campuses, taking a tour, imagining yourself at school, and I think many community college students, that is not the same process. And I think that, that um, those factors create a kind of pre-college experience that lends itself to some important differences that need to be thought about and considered when we're thinking about how to engage community college students, how to keep them in school. Um, it's, it's not a judgment at all. It's just noting these differences that for the most part, community college students uh, enroll uh, based on cost and location are the two primary factors. And that makes sense. But that's a very different set of questions and assumptions than your more traditional college student at a residential school. And this would also be true of, you know, you know, private or public four year colleges. Right, right. And what is college for all, th this term, what does that refer to? So we started to see an emphasis in the, uh, going back to the 1990s, um, as there were a lot of uh, uh, comparisons, uh, uh, comparing the United States with other, um, you know, uh, economically similar uh, countries about college rates and workforce and the connection. Um, and there became uh, this sort of trend that we should be pushing everyone to go to college. Um, that this, uh, you know, there was people in one camp thinking that this was about the um, competition of the American, you know, economic model, that we need more college educated workers. Um, you know, I think that there were some people who are more socially justice minded, who thought that we really should be democratizing higher ed. And so it, it came from a variety of forces. Um, at, at, but it was, you know, about um, making college a viable choice for more and more students, rather than what we had in the past, you know, in, in different times and places, certainly, where, uh, you know, certain people were left out of that, that college equation. Right. And so on the face of it, certainly, this sounds like a very positive thing, uh, uh, definitely as a college professor, uh, but even uh, just as, a, as an American citizen who cares deeply about education and knowledge acquisition, it would seem like uh, throwing the doors open, uh, throwing the doors of, of, of colleges and universities open for all to enter, this would seem like an inherently good thing. Um, are, are you saying that there, that, that there were sort of unintended consequences or blind spots in this vision of college for all? So you're right. Um, ideally, it, it is a good thing. Um, although, I mean, so there's a few things. I think um, some of the all those is that it's conceivable and possible that not everyone does want to go to college and what are their options. And so at the same time that we were pushing college for all, we were also diminishing the other options like vocational pro programs. Um, now in the past, vocational, which was more kind of um, a career or work uh, force uh, preparation, um, those tended to be um, uh, open to uh, more marginalized students, right? So there was, you know, some deep stratification of who we considered college and who we considered not college. So we don't necessarily want to return to that. But this uh, sort of betrayal of our vocational education, I think, was happening at the same time. And so that also, I think, funneled more and more people into the, uh, the, the, the college routes. Um, but a more problematic 
uh, set of occurrences was that as we were expanding or what we call democratizing higher education, we were funding it less and less. So our, our, our public funding of public education, higher ed especially, uh, was diminishing considerably at the same time. So we were both inviting people in, but making the, um, the institutions m- much more difficult to manage all of these newcomers to education. And I do think that this is a, a very important backstory to the completion crisis and some of the struggles that our students experience at the community college. Right. So to to get into that a little more, your book talks a lot about neoliberalism and uh, its impact on higher education. For people who are not familiar with this term, what exactly is neoliberalism and what impact does it have on institutions of uh, of, uh, higher education? So great question and um, a really important part piece of the story. Um, so neoliberalism is a, a is a political and economic philosophy uh, that um, is predicated on um, on a few things on um, the idea of you know the the, the state being a, a you know um, really not having much intervention in our public lives uh, and a diminishing role of the state in producing a social good uh, for some of our European listeners the, and, and others. They're going to think this is a crazy notion, but this is very, uh, <laughs> very American, but it has been a, a kind of a, the leading economic and political philosophy now since, you know, the, the 1980s. Um, and the, the consequences of, of, of this uh, are, are many. Um, so it means um, divesting in, in public goods, public libraries, public schools, public health, uh, and 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 to replace that public investment, we rely on the marketplace. So we rely on 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 um, the, what's called the free market, uh, and that that is uh, understood as a better purveyor of carrying, you know, of, of meeting these needs, these goods and services. Um, and it has had a dramatic effect on 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 our entire society and how we think of ourselves, right? I think it has a, has had a, a, an impact in how we think of our uh, participation in our own uh, in our own gover- governing uh, when we are reduced to taxpayer, right, or consumer as our primary identities. Uh, it, it affects how we vote and how often we vote or not, and it affects uh, how we think about the public good and funding it. Um, in terms of higher ed, you know, I think that um, it has been uh, a, a large part of the cause and the consequence of the defunding of public higher ed. So the shrinking of uh, of budgets towards um, public colleges, uh, and then that translates very much to diminishing of full time faculty and replacing full time faculty with what, what we call adjunct or contingent labor. So people on, um, you know, part-time contracts uh, who with, you know, disproportionately low pay, uh, no expectation that they're part of the larger community of the college in terms of major decision-making um, that erodes the quality of education that we offer. Um, it turns our students into consumers of their education. You know, I, I don't know if you've experienced this in your classroom, but I hear oftentimes my students talk about, well, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm paying for this class so that, you know, they've absorbed this language and we have too, you know, I, I think faculty have as well. Um, you know, so we, we, um, become, uh, sort of, a we embrace this sort of, um, corporate style mindfulness around education. So we talk in the language of best practices uh, or return on investments. Uh, It seeps into the way we think about ourselves in the institutions. And that makes metrics of success like completion rates and and retention rates, though not unimportant, unimportant, these become the primary ways in which we think about how we shape and reshape the institution and what gets lost is is learning what gets lost is um you know healthy dialogue around the directions we should take to help the very very different you know needs uh that we have in our you know uh, among those who go to our our institutions Right. And you mentioned already this idea of academic momentum that uh, you just, you mentioned in the book that Clifford Edelman came up with this concept of academic momentum, that you want to keep students 
engaged from the very beginning of their college experience and have them uh, as engaged as possible, including the sort of the maximum uh, number of courses that they could take, as well as kind of social uh, programming within the college in order to really solidify their you know, their presence in the college and to ensure that they continue to complete their degree. Um, again, a little bit like college for all, this would seem on the surface to be a very good thing, right? Don't we want students to, to be very engaged in their college experience? Isn't this uh, uh, an obvious good to keep academic momentum going? Uh, what exactly is the the kind of blind side or the, the, the shortcomings of this, this concept and of this vision of academic success? So, uh, you know, I think part of this answer is that uh, when we try to bring the theories to light and practice, there is often breakdown. Uh, and I think that some of that is, you know, is, is we have to take a look at what our assumptions are. When Clifford Edelman did his work, uh, uh, his research developing this idea of uh, academic momentum, as I mentioned before, um, it was done exclusively on four-year colleges and, and the students who attend there. So community colleges were left out of the original research. Um, the project that I was involved with uh, back in 2011 to 2013, um, what, you know, I, I, on CUNY, um, we decidedly and purposefully just looked at community college students. Um, and so, again, just to revisit this theory, the idea, it's kind of like the, uh, the, the physics uh, theory of momentum, right? Like a snowball effect, right? That the more it gains, you know, the, as the snowball goes down the mountain and it gets bigger and bigger, you know, and so the idea is students come into a college and the more that they are integrated in academically um, and socially, um, the, the more likely they will remain, they'll retain semester after semester and that they'll finish in a timely manner. And it does make sense kind of intuitively. Um, but the breakdown is really about, well, who are these students and how and why do they enroll and what are their patterns of enrollment? Um, and that is really, you know, again, kind of the, 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 the centerpiece of my of my book because it doesn't match very well in my opinion the real lives of many many community college students um, you know the way that momentum has been um, done in practice in many institutions but certainly at CUNY um, you, you mentioned before the 15 credits so for a student to be considered full-time uh, certainly for financial aid eligibility um, is 12 credits. Now, if you do the math, right, at a community college and a student takes, you know, 20, 12 credits a semester, 24 a year, they're not going to graduate in two years or three years with the number of credits that they need. Um, secondly, uh, the, our financial aid, uh, the federal financial aid, uh, anything above 12 credits you can take and you know, it's all covered for you. So this idea of academic momentum became sort of a fixture in many of, of in many of the minds of the administrations and community colleges around the country, certainly at CUNY. And so there was all these analyses done that our students were, you know, not taking enough credits to get them through faster. So what's the solution? Well, let's encourage more course taking. Um, but you know, and just yeah, interject, just yeah. interject for one second, um, uh, in case people are not familiar with the, the, the American system of education, when we talk about credits, um, uh, a, a typical course is three credits. So if we think of uh, a full course load as, as uh, 12 credits, that would be four courses that the student would take in a semester. And if we say no, in, instead of taking 12, they should really take 15. So we're really saying that students should take five courses each each semester in order to complete their degree as quickly as possible. Right. And for some students, that could work. Um, for most students, though, and this was, I know, what I was seeing in my classes, and this has been part of my experience teaching at BMCC for 20 years, 20 plus, is that for the majority of students, that's not a very good model. Um, because it is divorced from who they are and what their needs are, you know, both inside and outside the classroom. Um, so, you know, we, if we're going, you know, th there were a few, um, highlighted, uh, pro you know, uh, 
projects around CUNY and elsewhere where students with a B average or more, for example, um, when it came time to register, we'd get a pop-up message and their, you know, online registration, which is another part of this kind of neoliberal school, like uh, do-it-yourself model, um, you know, you are eligible to take another three-credit class. <laughs> and, you know, so a student might say, hey, wow. That sounds great. And very often they may find an online class to do that because that will save them time and transportation costs and all that. Um, so, we, but so you had students who were, you know, pushed to take 15 credits, what I call, you know, taking school in hyperspeed and what they were learning, how they were developing um, became you know, pushed way down on the priority list. It was all about getting them through. And this is a very different way of educating, certainly than their more wealthier counterparts at, you know, certainly more selective schools. And so this becomes a really important equity question of what kind of education do we want to have for students, especially who are, you know, again, the most academically and economically vulnerable. Uh, and, you know, as a teacher in these classrooms, that's not enough for me. That's not enough for my students. And this was the trend. These were some of the trends. Others, uh, you know, were right now overhauling our whole remediation uh, process. So students who need uh, to develop some academic skills before they're what's called college ready. Um, and this has been a, an important role in many community colleges for, for some time. Um, and, um, you know, they're, they're, were some troubling aspects to the way that remediation was done. Uh, and I uncovered, we uncovered some in the project that we, we did. Um, but um, what we're seeing is this, you know, vast change in how we are determining who is eligible for remediation. Um, we are compressing classes uh, shortening the time frame, we are combining credit bearing and non credit bearing remedial classes together, and it's for the sake of right of, of completion. And so right. again, the priority is shifting from this metric to you know towards this metric and away from what we're offering students. Right, and you mentioned about remediation courses and um, and how essentially for 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 a long time. Um, community colleges offered remediation courses, you know, uh, um, basic courses in in in, in English, um, uh, reading, in math, in in key skills that students would need in college if they came in and scored, you know, below a certain level, and and it was clear that they needed extra help in those areas. So, what happened, or what is happening to those remediation courses in? college campuses in in community colleges so some are being transformed so like at, at in at cuny we're seeing um uh what we're calling um uh co-requisite classes so we're combining let's say uh, a higher level remediation remedial course so the last before you get to the college you know with a uh, a college credit course so uh you know, we call them 101.5 classes, right? Um, and it's not, we're not, we don't know yet some of the impact, um, but I was troubled by this trend because there was a lot about the remedial quagmire, what it was called, that I think needed more research and attention. So one of the findings that, that kind of surprised me in our book uh, when we spoke to our students about their um, remedial experiences. Um, at CUNY, uh, students would, um, when they came in to uh, register, you know, there was like a, a it, it was a great uh, uh, example of uh, Weber's bureaucracy. <laughs> you know, like they were <laughs> sent to one office and, you know, financial aid office. And, and one among the many offices they were sent to was the testing office to take a test. Um, and um, the vast majority of the students we spoke to, and, and this was consistent in my own classes with my own students, um, did not know the purpose for this test when they sat and they took it. Um, for some of these students back in the day, they didn't, that was the first test they took on a computer. Um, wow. For some students who finished their math requirement in New York 
city public schools in the 10th grade and haven't taken math in a few years were expected to recall, you know, basic algebra. And, you know, and so a lot of the failures were the failures, in my opinion, of how this was done, the process by which we determined. And so that's what I mean by there were some issues to, to address with remediation. But the reason why um, it took such a quick turn towards um, uh, these newer changes was because remediation was keeping students from graduating like that again. So that was became the motivating force. Um, you know, there was a lot that could have been done before we got to that point of radically changing and, and maybe it will prove to be a success. I don't know. I, I, I worry that, you know, if, students need the time to um, develop some of their reading and reading comprehension skills. You know, this is important for us in a sociology 100 class so that the readings that we choose is something that our students can master. Um, and if we're pushing them to take a college level class and they're not getting the kinds of development skill building that they need, what does that mean for their success? What does that mean? You know, they may get the credits accumulated, but what does it mean for the quality of the learning that that they're that they're doing that they're that they're capable of? Because we, you know, that there's a lot of fat. You know, this isn't necessarily a, a, a narrative around their capabilities. It's a narrative of, of a whole sort of other thing. You know, a set of other things that need some attention before we start and completely um, get rid of remediation, which is now the trend. <laughs> right, right. So it seems that that often these days, community colleges are saying, well, we'll just gut the, re the remediation, <laughs> that that's slowing down students. So instead of looking at the need for remediation as a, a, a symptom of the fact that students, some of our students who are coming in are not fully prepared to sit for a college course, they look at, administrators look at remediation as the problem. So if we get rid of remediation, we'll get rid of the problem. Uh, a, a, a little bit like, uh, uh, maybe it's too uh, far afield of, of, of an analogy, but it seems a little bit like people who are promoting today, let's stop testing for COVID because if we just stop testing, right. there'll be no more positive away. tests. Right, it will yeah. go it away. Instead of looking at the, at the test as a mechanism to determine underlying conditions. Right. Yeah, no, that's a great parallel. Yeah. And it, and it's too bad. And I do think that this is, you know, again, driven by these same kind of, you know, neoliberal impulses of, of completion and, and, and quicker and faster. And, you know, I, at the same time, you know, I recognize that, you know, I've had students, really good students, really sharp students who could not graduate and could not take classes because they couldn't get through their remedial classes. And, you know, that... And as I, you know, I said, there, some attention is deserved. Uh, the CUNY Start program was one is a, is an interesting um, example. Uh, and just so th uh, for our listeners, so CUNY Start uh, is a program for students who need a lot of remediation. Um, so again, who sc score scores on their entrance exams were pretty low, um, or on their high school index that that they're now, um, where they, um, they start with just a semester of remediation, intensive remediation. Um, they're not actually, it's through a, a kind of a, a, a separate, but not so separate program. They're not take, taking any college, uh, level courses. Um, I've had some students who have gone through the program and, you know, who, um, we're so thankful for that opportunity to really, you know, look and 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 get their skills where it needed to be, um, and who've done very well in my classes. Um, so that might be something to consider. I know that there's also research to suggest that the stu students should be encouraged to take remedial classes early on and to take it consistently, you know, rather than a hodgepodge. You know, so there's there's models out there to take a look at, but we have to, uh, you know, I, I guess my my concern will always be what is driving this and what is and what is driving our evaluation of this. And, you know, how are we you know, there's uh, there's been some recent research uh, uh, in sort of the math remediation 
Um, this was done at CUNY, and I think it's been replicated elsewhere, where um, uh, students were placed in three different groups. Uh, students taking, they were all eligible for remedial math classes. Uh, one group took, uh, and this was a randomized control trial experiment, one group took uh, remedial math, uh, so it's a kind of pre-algebra, I think. Uh, one group took the same class with a built-in tutoring, uh, and then one class were of students who were remedial eligible went straight to a um, what we call Math 150, a statistics class, an intro to statistics. Um, and uh, the, the research showed very clearly that the students in this statistics class did much better. Their passing rates, their GPA was much better. So it called into question, so what are we doing with these remedial questions? My question is a methodological one, though, because those aren't equivalent courses, right? So I could imagine where students might really, especially if they have math phobia, which so many students uh, experience, that they may be more enlightened, if you will, or engaged in the statistic course, since statistics we see clearly all around us, right? You can make it interesting to someone who's interested in sports or someone who's interested in, you know, all kinds of things. Health. Health, right? Um, whereas an algebra class, you know, to get through that algebra, you know, may be more daunting or more phobic, you know, creating than a statistics class. So are they doing, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I would love to see this kind of research replicated with the same course, you know, so like, <laughs> uh, but I don't know how you would do that because the, the, the remedial algebra course is a particular course. It may mean that we should be rethinking what remedial math we want to offer our students and what, what kinds of skills we want them to develop. And I think those are, could be healthy conversations to have and important ones, but instead we're just getting rid of them. <laughs> right. And I, I have to say when I was reading your book and thinking about this idea of the neoliberal or market driven, uh, um, uh, mindset and how it impacts on public on public education. I kept on thinking about this uh, the book from Richard Hofstadter, Anti Intellectualism in American Life from the nineteen sixties, and he talks about how you know his argument is that many aspects of uh, American life uh, are really anti intellectual, including. Um, a capitalist, including uh, um, um, business tycoons, and that he shows how uh, you know throughout American history, essentially the, the, the business people look down at education and said, why do we need it? You know, we need people who are able to be in the factory or able to be in the, um, and, and, you know, run businesses. We don't need people to sit there reading all these books, you know? And then as, um, um, uh, uh, industrialization became more complex, and as um, uh, businesses needed people who were able to uh, do kind of higher um, uh, level um, tasks, uh, businessmen supported education, but essentially only to the extent that they felt that the education would be useful quote unquote, for business. So that they weren't really interested in people reading Shakespeare or reading Homer or, 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 or reading, um, you know, philosophy books. They just wanted people who were technologically advanced enough to be able to fill the jobs that needed to be filled. And it seems to me like that's part of that. This basic uh, uh, outlook is still very much you know, with us, when you talk about getting students to finish quickly and that essentially all that the the marketplace is valuing is the credential, the fact that a student has the diploma and they could say, yes, I checked off that box. Now I could go take an entry level job at your company, you know, rather than saying, what is the true value of education and how could we be sure that our students are getting the most that they possibly can from their educational experience? Right. Yeah. I, I you know, and I, I think, you, you know, I, I, and it serves, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of thinking, I think, serves the status quo quite well, right? Because, you know, what do we gain, you know, what, what do, what is a college education 
supposed to do? What is its purpose, right? And, you know, it's to deepen our intellectual capacities. It's to develop our uh, ability to look at something and critically analyze it, right? We're seeing the breakdown of that in our political culture right now, um, including many of the people in the media. Um, and, um, you know, I think, and, you know, I, 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 I always, when I think about these things, I return to this question of equity. And, you know, so who is it higher education for and how, right? Um, and, you know, the more selective schools are still doing a, quite a good job of developing intellectual development and, and critical capacity. Um, and if we are really serious about not only democratizing, but making higher ed equal and, and more equitable, um, we need to ensure that you know, throughout our range of higher ed institutions from the community college on, on up, we are, um, you know, I say in the book, serving the students, you know, we are uh, allowing for students, you know, we're, we're planting seeds for students to flourish and, you know, and, and it's more than just the piece of paper, um, you know, and yeah, I, you know, that at least that's my hope. I mean, I, and I do think actually most of our students would want that. I mean, you can, you can feel it, you can see it, you can, you can hear it. Um, even from students who I think never thought of themselves as college students. I think when they are sitting in a classroom and feel respected and challenged and inspired, they thrive. Um, and they should have that ability to thrive. Uh, you know, if, if we really care about, um, questions of equity and, 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 uh, and the purpose of higher ed. Right. Absolutely. And to go back to a, a comment you made earlier, um, you mentioned the so-called uh, college completion crisis. So um, just to address that directly, is there a crisis in uh, community colleges that uh, you know, uh, students are not completing um, their degrees in a, in a timely manner? Or is this uh, framing of the issue itself deeply um, kind of problematic and off base? Well, I, I actually think it's both. I mean, I do think that, that the statistics warrant some attention. Um, you know, when you say that, um, uh, you know, in, in 2019, for example, out, you, so just to clarify some terms, so retention, the retention rate uh, is the, um, the uh, rate that uh, uh, the students returning to the same school um, that they first started. Persistence is students return from one year to this first one year to, to year two. Uh, persistence is uh, students returning to any school. So that's the distinction made in, in a lot of the data. Um, you, I mean, there's, there's a few things here. So how do we measure timely graduation, right? Um, you know, is two year ineffective? No longer. Three year, which is still co commonly used, not really also going to adequately reflect how students go to college. Um, there is more recently, just prior to COVID, uh, an attempt to extend the calendars to six year to eight year um, to see. And, you know, you do that and you do see um, racial and ethnic gaps close in terms of graduation rates. You do see graduation rates uh, increase. Um, some of the problem is that, uh, you know, in one of the chapters, I take a deep dive into the way in which we, um, way in which the data is generated, what data sets do we use? And, you know, w we have a problem right now with um, a, a kind of a fetishization around data. So, you know, we, we show me the data, you know, data driven and, and, and these mantras you hear all over the place. Um, it's very easy to show numbers, but if they're not given any kind of context or you don't question, well, how is the data generated? Your, your analysis is, is, is underdeveloped. And so if you don't, if you include or don't exclude from your, you know, your data students who have no intention to graduate, <laughs> So, you know, at CUNY, we have the uh, John Jay College of uh, Criminal Justice and a lot of the students, a lot of our police force who go to college take their, um, you know, do their education there. Um, well, for the police academy, from what I understand, you only need a certain number of credits and then you go straight on to the police academy. So, for example, John Jay's graduation rate has often been 
very low, but that's because a vast majority of their students never intended to graduate. In, you know, and so with community college, if you don't consider the transfer effect when you're looking at the graduation rates, which many of our rates don't, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's not an accurate understanding of how many students who start there who intend to graduate there because most of our students do say they want to transfer. Um, and so it, it becomes this muddy mess of, uh, so crisis, I think, I don't like to use the word crisis because I think it becomes co-opted in that way that Naomi Klein helped us see with the shock doctrine, you know, effect of, you know, again, what neoliberalism does, it creates a, uh, a crisis. And then we find ways to address the crisis that is in accordance with this sort of corporate model. Um, and that's, you know, I lay this out in the book. Um, but that's not to say I'm not, you know, concerned and nor we should be concerned with whether our students are able to retain and graduate um, in a timely way. Um, whatever that means. I mean, I think that part of this, uh, the uh, focus on momentum and graduation um, has really pushed aside the vast majority of our community college students nationwide who are part-time students. Because the academic momentum theory says, you know, part-time students are the least likely to, 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 to stick with it. But we know from CUNY, even though they're the minority percentage in terms of, uh, you know, uh, enrollment intensity, Part-time students are often part-time students for very good reasons. There's no amount of money, effort, time, whatever, that's going to make them transform to part-time to full-time. We found that out in our project when we tried. And so rather than pushing them aside or rather than only focusing on getting students to take more classes, maybe we should create better ways and better pathways for these part-time students who should be able to have it, you know, and you should be able to have a good education. And I guess maybe this is, you know, my own family history with my grandmother, who I never got to meet, who, you know, put herself through downtown city college, downtown one class at a time while raising two kids on her own, you know, in the 1940s and fifties. Um, and she, she did it and it took her a really long time, but she was able to do it. And I want students of today to be able to do that, even if they do it slowly. Um, and I do think that that's an important function of a community college uh, to be able to uh, enable that. Right. So in essence, you're saying that if we, if community colleges adopt a, 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 a market driven model for success that says that students must complete their degree in X number of years, it's a very rigid model and by definition, it excludes all sorts of possible avenues for degree completion that may be very uh, um, uh, necessary for particular uh, groups of students. But if you if you are only looking at a very narrow um, framing of what success means, those students and and the those avenues that they would in theory pursue uh, become eliminated. True. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I think we can see this in all kinds of ways. I mean, you know, one of the one of the examples I mentioned in the book. So for the period, I think it was 2000. It was a five year period. So it must have been 2012 to 2017, I think, um, at, at community college. Uh, so a real uh, substantial increase in graduation rates. Uh, and again, this was during this, you know, kind of height of momentum kind of programs and policies. But at the same time, uh, they also uh, saw uh, the highest rates of students going on academic probation. And you have to wonder, well, what is the correlation? <laughs> you know, are there, uh, is there a reason why at the same time you can have high graduation rates and high, ac and for those of you, you know, academic probation just means that students are uh, doing very poorly academically in their classes. And, and there's consequences for that. Like they, you know, have to stop, you know, attending school for a while, if not, you know. Um, and so that's, I think, an example that it, it is, it really speaks to what you just asked, you know, and, 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 and that kind of, um, and it's also, I think, what it happens when we design policies really without really knowing who the students are and why, you know, how and why they enroll. And, you know, I, in the book, I, I, um, I, uh, 
talk about this uh, concept that I call the student sensibility. Uh, and I draw from a variety of different traditions in sociology and different uh, theoretical traditions from Bourdieu to Arlie Hochschild to Annette Leroux uh, that really talks about how students see themselves as students and their attunement to being a student and all that they, without trying to portray this as a deficit, but just as, a, as an understandable consequence of, um, you know, again, the absence of family socialization around college going, the absence of knowing a whole lot of people who go to college, uh, knowing that it's important for, the, for careers and the workforce, but not really being brought in as a, as a, as a place for um, intellectual development. Um, and I think that we need to be better informed and better attuned to who our students are, what they want from college, what they know and don't know, um, before we start, a, you know, full scale change uh, that is supposed to improve their completion rates. Right. And in the final chapter of your book, you present an alternative paradigm to neoliberal education based on the concept of caring institutions. What do you mean by that term? So um, I was fortunate enough to be a student uh, back in my days with Joan Tronto, who is one of the, um, uh, I don't know, the foremothers of care theory and the, the ethics of care. Uh, and she has deeply influenced the way I think about just about everything uh, <laughs> from, from Marx on up. Uh, and, um, you know, she, she talks about, you know, uh, you, you know, so when we say care, it's, it, you know, it's not just a, a, a you know, a, 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 it's not just an activity. It's not a disposition. It's, it's all of that. Like we are deeply Im embedded in our relationships with others and we come into this world in need of care and we leave this world very often in need of care. Um, and to, to understand how our relationships um, are really, um, dramatically centered on, on caring for and giving care to others. Um, it is actually what makes us human. Um, and, and, and so it, it has, it has long been held as a, as a, an opposing theory to this, you know, the, the self-actualized, uh, you know, individual, individual, um, uh, person of, of, of certainly the liberal tra tradition and, pol and political philosophy. Um, when it comes to institutions, I think that a lot of the theory behind this idea of caring relationships, you know, it gets tricky. Can, can an institution really care about people? Um, what I draw out in the last chapter um, is not only an antithetical model, but I also take a look at the way in which the care language has been already co-opted and brought into the institution uh, in, a, in a kind of way that we, uh, that in, in business we call uh, emotional branding, right? So, you know, uh, we see this here at CUNY when we're, you know, there's lots of talk and discussion about a culture of care that, you know, so we're addressing the needs of students and this is coming out of real research that, you know, also we need to be attuned to about, you know, students who are struggling with housing insecurity and food insecurity and, and mental health issues. Uh, and we, we absolutely need more institutional support, uh, to, 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 um, respond to these needs. Um, but what we're doing is we're, um, we're sort of crafting it as a, a kind of a, a, a way to um, say we're responding with, you know, <laughs> where informally without caring in substance. Uh, and I don't mean that staff don't care about students at all or faculty. I, I'm not suggesting that. But like, you know, having a food pantry in a, in a community college is really great and really important. But that's only, you know, the start. <laughs> um, and, you know, in a real caring institution, again, following the kind of theoretical tradition of the ethics of care, everyone in that institution, every one of their needs needs to be cared for. And what we see in this use of care is that the students are cared about. But the people doing the care work, their needs are not met. So whether it's the exploited, you know, adjunct part time faculty member um, or the overworked and understaffed, you know, staff person in, in, in you know, oversubscribed and understaffed offices. Um, and, and we highlight these very sort of um, 
you know, emotional heart, uh, what's that word called when you plug, uh, you tug at the, the heart strings of, you know, the, the faculty, mem- uh, the faculty person who, you know, went to the hospital to give the oral exam to the student lying in bed, you know, like, and these are these examples that are highlighted and, and <laughs> while they're beautiful, like A, it's not sustainable and B, you know, like what gets left out of the picture, certainly from a, you know, an important Marxist standpoint is, well, what happens to the, you know, the labor that is in, you know, is required to carry out that, you know, that care work. Uh, And so that the labor of those who work in institutions are um, rendered even more invisible than they already are. And this is sort of the problem. So, you know, I, I try to, you know, I wanted to end the book with some practical ways in which we can move forward. Um, and, and I, and again, in this sort of, um, ethic of care more expanded and more substantive than it often is. Um, I think we really need to address the lack of mental health care, um, uh, support services. Uh, I think that there should be a psychiatrist, uh, on every community college campus, or at least access to that. Um, not to mention more, uh, mental health uh, 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 counselors. Um, uh, I think, uh, offering more, um, employment opportunities to students that are on campus. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, it was Sarah Goldrick Robb's book, uh, Paying the Price. Uh, she had a, a whole section on the work study program and how it tends to be, um, you know, more pronounced at places where students you know, not at, you know, not at community colleges, in other words, you know, we do have work study students, I don't know the percentages, it's something I actually want to look into more readily, but I'm surprised by the lack of, you know, whether it's financially, you know, aid subsidized or other kinds of um, work site uh, possibilities that could not only um, help the institutions run, but it could offer students a way to stay on campus uh, without having to travel so much uh, to work. Uh, it can open up doors of opportunities and people who they meet and other kinds of resources. It can make this school feel more uh, that it's for them. Like, I, you know, I, I do think that, and I'm kind of returning to what we said in the beginning, you know, I don't think these other aspects, these non-academic factors uh, that I think are really important get lost in the momentum prioritization, right? The sense of belonging. Um, the feeling of validation, you know, I, I hear, I, we heard it while doing the project, uh, but I hear in my, uh, among my students, I advise and teach all the time. So I'm not here to make friends, you know, and, and I, I respect that, but like friendship and friendship networks, like that is a huge <laughs> part of the college experience. And what could it look like if community college were able to provide possibilities for that and and you know and and it is hard for them when they're running from class to work and fitting in family responsibilities but in what ways can we address those very particular needs um better and and that that is what i i don't think is happening in the discourse and the practices around the completion crisis right well there's so much more to talk about your book it's really uh, a fascinating and and really important and timely work um but we for today we have to leave it there thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today really appreciate it well thank you for inviting me this was a real treat that concludes our program thanks for listening and have a great day